Binaural is something that I find very fascinating. And every time you watch my podcast, you hear me say that because mm. I'm, I'm so fascinated by it. Okay. Um, the first time I heard binaural, you take off the headphones and you're a little bit surprised that you're not mm -hmm. in the space that you, you were in with the production. That's one of the more fascinating technologies that I see for the future. What are some of the technologies that have only arrived over the last 10 or five years that you're now using? Mm -hmm. And maybe what are some future technologies that you're looking forward to? Okay. Um, so certainly formats like Dolby Atmos and, and uh, MPEG-H, they are bringing like object-based audio to the mainstream, you could definitely say. Explain what that is for those who are not familiar. Object-based? Mm -hmm. um, Okay, so um, for me, it's so natural that it's hard to explain even because um, I'm always thinking and working on objects and I think everyone actually does that in a DAW. If you have a track, you have an object. So and if you position that in your stereo space, you could also talk about doing object-based audio. But then the difference is that when you play it out later, the print master that you deliver, it carries kind of, if you think back to that stereo production, it would carry the stems and even multi-tracks in it with the panning information. So going to spatial audio and bigger systems, we are disconnecting the production side where I am placing objects, audio objects, like panning them um, from the reproduction side where I'm using a rendering system that takes that information, like every audio, stream plus metadata information where is the object in that very moment and then it's trying its best to use the speakers it has in its system it just knows where the speakers are and reproduce what that sound field is supposed to be and um, that is different to channel based because in channel based we would play out a rendered sound for each speaker so when we have stereo we do that we have a stereo bus and this is just one stereo file we are delivering and when we do 5.1 surround we do the same we deliver for each speaker in that system and then we we can add height to it and we even have like 5.14 we have four layers in the height and we actually can do the same with channel based uh, but the object based is really just the way we deliver the, the, the production. So where a channel base, you're delivering one file for a mono and it's an audio file or two files yeah. for stereo and they're both audio files. Exactly. Or, right, 7.1.4 or, or exactly. and it's 12 audio files yes. that will be played through those speaker channels. Right. In object-based mixing, you're actually delivering an end reproduction file that includes the airplane audio file and then data about where it is in this three-dimensional space exactly yeah That's so you amazing. can you can have a you know you can have it rendered at the end in 5.1 on a 5.1 system but it might still be 64 channels of audio with all the objects that you just mentioned the airplane flying and all that and this position then it gets rendered for this speaker system in particular but the good thing and cool thing about that is you don't have to decide during production where it's going to be played back and i think that's the that's the new innovative thing about um, object based audio that you're really disconnecting these two things which brings a lot of freedom if you think about it because if you basically could just deliver one mix carrying all those objects and then one day there's a device that only has like one speaker, my kitchen radio, for example, and it knows how to deal with that one speaker in the best possible way. So it creates the best possible mix of all those objects that are coming in and um, trying to make it sound good. Same with stereo system, it could do that. So it's kind of taking this, what mastering engineers would usually do with a stereo mix. And I mean, we are definitely not at a point where this technology can uh, replace the mastering engineer it's gonna sound a thousand times better with a proper stereo mastering but you get so much more flexibility in the format um, that i think it has a quite big future so that's that's one of the 
inventions, let's say, of the last years. And I think what object-based also enables us and will enable us in the future is right now we have to, well, I have to move back. So we have to think about uh, degrees of freedom, which means like, how can I move inside an audio mix? Let's say when we think about spatial audio, we have the room. The question is now, how can I as a listener move inside it? It's pretty easy if you have the speaker set up in the room and you can move inside the room just freely. Then obviously you we, we say we have six degrees of freedom. We can walk in three directions, like, you know, up and down, left, right, front, rear. And we can also rotate our head, which is another three degrees of freedom for rotation. And um, right now, when we bring that to translate it to binaural rendering, um, most of the time we would have only the three degrees of freedom. So in an ambisonics format, we could possibly like rotate our head. By the way, in binaural, you're such a fan of it, but if you have a binaural mix that you deliver, it's already just a stereo file and you cannot do the rotation inside. But um, with formats like ambisonics, you could do that. So Ambisonics being one of the formats that have been developed for many years, but it's also something that became more and more popular and actually had its first application, I would say, like a mainstream application with uh, the advent of the 360 videos on YouTube. Um, but then also with object-based mixes, you are even more free because you can virtually also place the listener inside that room because you have all the metadata information still in all the audio. So the renderer could possibly like move you inside that space, which is, for example, what also happens in, in, in game engines and games. So we are doing that already since many years, but now it's bringing it all together and, and putting it to the next level. And these renderers become more um, extensive when it comes to having binaural 3D audio rendering you get a, a much better a realistic rendering than you would have 10, 15 years ago in a game engine. Is the main difference going from 10, 15 years ago, we had stereo rendering to now binaural rendering. The main difference is the HRTF or is there something else that I'm missing? There is, yeah, I mean, all types. Yeah, it's. I think it's true. It's just, uh, it's in the end, it's the HRTF that okay. is being added. Um, because all the um, time of arrival differences and level differences is what was being used in stereo already. Now we're adding this HRTF to make it sound like it's 3D and really coming from that position. Yeah. So in the rendering process, this is what actually happens. Cool. So yeah, mm. the, the time of arrival, the level differences between each ears, that's a part of stereo that we've been using for a long time. Right. And now we're getting into this HRTF head related transfer function where we're taking into account the acoustical characteristics of our outer ears and our skull. And that's making it even more immersive. Of course, there is one limitation that everyone has different shaped, have differently shaped ears and differently shaped skulls, but even solutions are be ma being made for those as well. Yeah. I think there has also been uh, research, recent research that's saying that possibly like the individual HRTF is maybe not the most important thing to have because you can train your brain to having a new set of HRTFs and uh, your brain gets used to that and then you start, you know, hearing better with that. But I'm, I'm not so much in that research. So maybe it has already, <laughs> you know, something new of results there. So the main limitation right now would be that, yes, you can put on headphones or have an immersive audio system and control a character on a screen with a control with a joystick and that position of your character determines what you're hearing. So if there are, there's a car crash to the right and an alarm starts going off and you turn your character to the right, well, that now gets panned center right ahead of you. Yes. The next step might be, can we play with those first three degrees of, uh, of movement with the joystick, but then control the other three degrees of rotation of our head with our head? Can we track the person's head mm -hmm. so that if your character is looking straight and then you, the player, look over to the right, 
yeah. your soundscape changes. Yeah, you need that um, hat tracking for everything where you're rendering in binaural. So um, I think, yes, this is something, it was focused on the screen that had you, you had in front of you back then, and now you could actually focus it on your point of view. And so this is very important for virtual reality because there you can actually change your viewing angle and see like differently whilst before you would change your viewing angle only on the screen in front of you. So the panning would also move with that and it would know the position due to your um, mouse movements or your keyboard movements. But now it's it's becoming more realistic and natural because you are taking on the VR classes and then your head rotation defines like what you are seeing. And that is something we need to take into account when we do the binaural rendering, yes. But I think technology-wise, when it comes to binaural rendering, it could have been the same. Let's say if you have a 2D screen in front of you, you could take that information and the angle that you're looking at and just do the binaural rendering based on that. So it could have been done before. Maybe it was done before even. I'm not familiar with games that had binaural. But I think what I what I wanted to say is what's the new thing with optic-based audio in terms of becoming a mainstream and not maybe only for games um, is that it opens up these new possibilities also for other applications. So you could think about a kind of sound installation that you can walk through and you the you know the listener is being tracked and gets his individual binaural mix on the headphones due to his location in the room and in his viewing angle something like that i mean i couldn't name like the proper application yet but that's the beauty of it because um you know it's it's kind of we are in the field of experimentation at the moment and uh, face i mean and uh, we possibly will see a new new ideas and things popping up in this very, very interesting field.